Well, hello everybody. My name is Robert Davidson, and today I'd like to talk about composition as collaboration. Pictured here is my ensemble topology. I'm there on double bass uh, with the choir, the Australian Voices, as conducted by Gordon Hamilton. As director of topology, I've led a large number of collaborations across a wide range of cultural style and art form boundaries. The first big one we did was over 20 years ago. You can see me here 20 years ago with my group when we combined with the jazz trio loops to celebrate 100 years of radio with a piece called airwaves co-composed by myself and the bass guitarist jonathan diamond from loops both of us had been composing with speech melody for quite a few years and so that was how we met uh, in this musical work to give a flavor of the music here's one of my contributions this famous speech of martin luther king <laughs> So just a bit of a snapshot of what I was doing 20 years ago. We performed that same piece, which was composed at the end of 2001, 10 years later at the Singapore Arts Festival. This was uh, from the Singapore Arts Festival um, brochure. And we included in that one, Jonathan uh, setting of Lee Kuan Yew's August 1966 speech at the First National Day. You can see an excerpt from the score here. Um, so I chose to work with this group of a jazz group in order to sort of up the challenge a bit because topology being quite classically based, even though actually within the ensemble, our sax player here, you can see here, Jonathan, John is a jazz musician. But um, I wanted to collaborate across that boundary of genre. Um, now, what had happened is I'd been, I, I chose to start really getting into collaboration because I'd been part of a study where I was asked to come in and collaborate for one day with people I'd never met. And there was a bunch of different groups and they all had to come up with a, a performance, a five minute performance at the end of the day, such as, uh, you know, playwrights working with set designers, working with composers, working with um, actors and things like that. And then in the write up, I noticed that one of the groups was criticized for not really collaborating because the composer of the group had been far too inflexible. And that was me. <laughs> so I thought, OK, well, that's a lesson. I need to learn how to loosen up and collaborate. I guess I'd been so used to writing scores where you specify everything ahead of time and you give it to the performers and they obey your instructions. And so coming to collaboration was uh, difficult for me. And so when I started working with this group, diff different priorities as jazz musicians and different uh, areas of focus, it was quite a challenge to be able to let go and allow things to um, to come together to go beyond my own expectations and control um, and to actually allow oneself to grow beyond one's own abilities and, and allow other ideas to come in. So then we found that collaboration highly effective in stretching both groups out of their comfort zones and creating something bigger than the sum of the parts. And it helped that we all felt very comfortable with each other as friends. We'd known each other for quite a long time. 
and had spent together and had mutual respect and trust, things which I think are important to collaboration, as we'll see as we go on today. And another collaboration that I'm showing here, uh, the ad for the concert was with the Australian Voices in 2011, many others in between. Um, this is the Australian Voices, a fabulous Australian choir who are very enthusiastic about exploring new territory and challenging themselves. This was a very deep collaboration between myself and the conductor, Gordon Hamilton. We booked the concert before we knew what we were going to do for it. And then we booked a week at Stradbroker Island and we went away there and we spent all today, all day together, swimming and surfing and eating and things. But we also spent a lot of time programming the concert and just coming up with ideas musically. He's also a composer. And we co-created quite a few pieces which were partially improvised, which would require creative rehearsal with the choir as well. The end result was a partially graphic score heavily based on the magpie sounds that we were hearing. That's a famous Australian bird hearing on the island. From this collaboration, I learned the importance of spending time together and really discussing differences. Topology had recently felt quite dissatisfied after collaborating with a different group as there had been not enough time together outside the rehearsals and we felt rather trampled over as there'd been a presumption about how to work together as in there's a presumption that the other group that their way, way of working was our way of working but however it wasn't it really clashed with how we like to work so we ended up sort of pretty much sacrificing our way of working and just fitting in with them and it wasn't very satisfactory so while we were working with Gore and with the choir, we ensured that we had plenty of time hanging out together socially and talking through and negotiating differences. It was very open and, and a lot of trust developed as a result. And I thought it was a really nice collaboration, this concert. And it turned out to be quite an important aspect of collaboration, as again, as I'll see, we'll see later in the talk. So this collaboration, this is where we were in Stradbuck Island. So it's a great place to collaborate and just have a lovely time. Fortunately, one of the patrons of the choir had a cabin over there, which uh, she gave us for free. So it was great for a week. So that that particular collaboration gave us the desire to do more together. So we met at our favorite cafe here, the Lychee Lounge. Um, and I, got, I met with the choir's producer and patron, Scott Griffin, and one of the choristers, Elena Shack, and a conductor, Gordon Hamilton. And we just went to this cafe for a big brainstorm to talk about what idea might be good for a piece. And we sat there and for, for a couple of hours and just talked about all sorts of random ideas of what we liked and what was exciting to us at the moment, wondering what a choral version might be of some of the ideas we were talking about. Some of the ideas we mentioned were Steve Reich's slow motion sound, an old piece from 1967, which was originally just a concept because it couldn't be realized in 1967. It can be now, which is a way of stretching out a piece of music that led to thinking about this piece. Leif Inger's nine beat stretch in which he took the Beethoven Ninth Symphony and stretched it out with time stretching audio software so that it lasts 24 hours. This is a bit of it. So um, Elena had heard the performance of that, uh, an installation of that in Europe. And it's amazing, like just something which would have just been a brief crescendo becomes this epic journey, which takes five minutes or longer. And, and it's quite mind bending. Um, and that was from way back 20 years ago. Another piece we mentioned was Peter, or Peter Ablinger's Deus Cantando, where a piano is played by a computer and reproduces the sound of the voice. <laughs> So that's just the piano making that sound. There's no recording. It's using the, the piano notes to be like a tape recorder. We thought that was magic. And we're thinking, how could you do something like that with a choir? Another idea was Twin Peaks, where um, what happened in this 1991 film, which is then re redone recently, but uh, the dialogue was recorded and then reversed. And then the reversed sound imitated vocally and recorded that and then they reversed that again to come back to the original forward dialogue but in a strange manner now because it's been been through that whole process she's mine yes, me. Yeah. 
Was das nicht hier? So I really like how, how creepy that sounds. <laughs> that was one of the ideas. These all all of these these ideas were brewing, and then they were in my mind. All these ideas came up, and I was thinking about how can these all come together. We continued over email. This is an email from Gordon. We're in Berlin having a great tour. I think with the piece we can do it like this, etc. So he had this idea. Didn't actually end up using it, but he did say this. We still have to work out what audio to recreate. Maybe a famous speech. He knew about my airwaves where we had these famous speeches or an iconic orchestral moment like the opening of the Rite of Spring. We're thinking, how could we reproduce that chorally with just a choir having a, like something like that piano is reproducing something which you wouldn't expect a piano to sound like. Can we get a choir to do something which you wouldn't expect a choir to sound like? Well, what I settled on as a famous speech was this one. Kevin Rudd, our prime minister, I had gone along to hear this when it happened in 2008, um, three years earlier, I'd attended this national apology speech in Canberra, our prime minister apologizing to the indigenous stolen generations, children, Aboriginal children who'd been removed from their families, the primary factor being that they were Aboriginal. I had the idea of stretching out this short apology to great length, like the nine beat stretch, the Beethoven ninth being stretched out. And then seeing if we could vocally imitate the stretched out sound, like the Twin Peaks dialogue, and compressing it back to normal speed to see if we could hear Kevin Rudd's voice again, purely from the sound of the choir only without his actual voice being present. We apologize especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. That was a key speech in Australia's recent history. I wanted to just take the two words, we apologise. So I took that and I stretched it out down from one second to six minutes. And this is what I told, what I'm thinking is that the choir could sing each bar separately. I could provide a guiding score. Then we put it all together and squash it back down in stages to one second. So I gave that to him and I'd broken it up into bars. So a few different ideas coalesced for this. One was that making a, a brief apology like that was is easy and short, but the actual process of reconciliation takes years. And that's what was actually happened on the lawn the next day. Someone put up this, sorry is only the first step. Sorry, the first step but the, the work goes on for years. So that idea of a short apology versus a long process. Another idea was, we'll listen to a bit of the piece that re resulted. This is the, the choir singing the slowed down stretched audio, but the uh, proportion was the length of time that there's been um, Aboriginal occupation of Australia or living in Australia versus settler Australians, 200 years of the settlers and 50,000 years of Aboriginal people living here. And I thought I'd take that same proportion to take the one second of audio to make it out to six minutes. Oops, so I was going to show you that's 200, 227 years. Well, it's actually a bit longer than that now. 50,000 years. And this is the sound of it. This is the choir singing that slowed down sound. So that goes on for six minutes because I've taken 227 years out to 50,000 years. I've taken one second out to six minutes, the same proportion. And then they sang that sound. Um, we apologize. We apologize. That's five times. <laughs> Etc. 
that's the sound stretched right out to six minutes that I use for the choir to sound. This is this is how it sounds. Now this is a close up of a tongue. <laughs> I started to feel like it was like putting a microscope on Kevin Rudd's voice, like going right inside his mouth. I also felt like it was like his voice stretching out across the entire Australian landscape, as it actually did with the broadcast of the speech. Anyway, so that keeps going. It's a little bit like this. You, you notice more details when you slow things down. rather disgusting film of slow motion sneezing so that's like it puts a microscope on this voice we took that whole six minutes and then they learnt to sing it bar by bar it took three hours we sat together in rehearsal they learnt the first bar audio it didn't have a score the score came later actually as a more of a mnemonic reminder but they had to get it in their ear they had to get the timbre right so it was a very unusual piece for me, and, and it came out to be a very unusual choral texture that I really liked, but I would never have written, probably. Beautifully tam beautiful timbrely and things. Anyway, this is a little film which demonstrates how the piece works in a bit of a shorter form. <laughs> Sometimes it sounds like a didgeridoo, and sometimes it sounds very metallic. As you listen to it getting faster, it makes sense. I couldn't believe that we did it. But we weren't sure if that was going to work at all. Is this really happening? I, I was very surprised. I was one of the squeaky nerds. <laughs> Supremely cool. And the easy thing to do to say, to put on this apology, the real work of reconciliation is far, far longer. Take a little chunk of audio, uh, Kevin Rudd saying, we apologise from his historic apology to the stolen generations. Taking this audio, slowing it down by many hundreds of times, and having a choir sing this slow down version. <laughs> He's recorded us singing this and then sped it up to the original speed, twice as fast and then four times as fast. And then eight times as fast and so on until we reached the original speed. So it was a five minute recording compressed into one second. message I'd love to contribute to somewhat with this piece. Yeah, so I was very happy with how that came out. It actually worked. For one thing, I didn't know it was going to work. Um, I don't know why this is not... Oh, I didn't know it was going to work, but I, I really liked the sound anyway, of just that slowed down audio and, and what it meant and all of those different meanings and the proportions. But then it actually did, you could hear his voice at the end, so that was really exciting um, that we, we had that big brainstorm all these different ideas and it coalesced together into a piece that felt conceptually quite nice to me. The process was very collaborative because in exploring these concepts and in actually performing it, uh, it that was collaborative. Like I said, it, 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 we didn't, I didn't have a score with all instructions. I said, we need to listen to each bar. Uh, in, uh, I, I divided it up into, the, into bars and it took three hours to learn it. And then we sang it and recorded it. And then, uh, I played it back and did this, this compress and compression, but I couldn't do that straight away. And actually the choir was on tour and then um, I sent it through by a text, uh, the, the final result that it had actually worked and they were all on a tour bus together and I heard them back on the tour bus cheering that it had actually worked because we didn't know it was going to work. 
So, and since then we've, re we've performed it many times live using the score and then recording it and doing it on stage with a laptop and actually compressing it back and the audience is always quite surprised. So I really loved doing that rather unusual approach to music with this choir because they're so open-minded and wanting new ideas. So let, I said, let's do more collaboration. And I started a whole collection of speeches by Australian prime ministers set to music by using their audio like this, except in different ways. Another speech I did was the speech of an Aboriginal leader, Noel Pearson, speaking at the funeral of, of one of our most colourful prime ministers, Gough Whitlam. This piece was broadcast on a popular te television program Q&A with Noel Pearson, the speaker, himself there, not having any idea that there was about to be a choir singing along to his recorded speech. We'll finish tonight and the year with performance from the Australian Voices, conducted by Gordon Hamilton. They're performing a piece composed by Rob Davidson based on Noel Pearson's widely celebrated speech at the Whitlam Memorial in 2015. <laughs> Good night. You see him looking sideways. <laughs> short and then I took it as quite a compliment that a few days later on a comedy show The Chaser, a popular show in Australia, this was parodied. In the interest of ABC efficiency we thought we'd steal Q&A's idea. So to say goodbye, please welcome the Inner West Voices with their choral tribute to the lesser orators of Australian politics in 2014. <laughs> So it was like a, a political cartoon. Um, one of the Prime Minister's speeches I set was Robert Menzies declaring Australia to be at war in 1939. I started out by writing out the melody I heard in his voice, and then I found a harmonic progression that best fit his melody. It turned out to be a lament with a descending bass line, which really suited the melancholy nature of the speech. Here is the Prime Minister of Australia. Right Honourable R.G. Menzies. Fellow Australians, it is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of a persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her and that as a result, Australia is also at war. It is my melancholy duty to inform you that in consequence of a persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her, and that as a result, Australia is also at war. It is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of a persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her, and that as a result, Australia is also at war. Okay, I'm going to skip over because I realise we have quite a lot of uh, material to look at before we run out of time here. One of the most exciting uh, Prime Minister Australian speeches was given by Julia Gillard, our first female Prime Minister, when she responded to constant misogynistic treatment over months and years in Parliament. 
The Prime Minister had often been maligned for her voice, for example, by the Premier of New South Wales, Bob Carr, who said she had a strained, scratchy monotone. So it took, I, have, I was quite delighted to set her voice and show that it was actually very musical. Um, and she herself has often talked about how she really enjoys the choral treatment that I composed for the, for the piece called Not Now, Not Ever. Here she is talking on the radio to Margaret Throsby. Can we talk about the lead up to the misogyny speech? I don't want to spend a lot of time because you talk about it and it's been well, well, well covered. In fact, it's been, song. it's been set to music. <laughs> have you seen that on YouTube? It's very, yes, it's very good, actually. It it's is very, very funny. good. So that was quite gratifying to have the subject herself uh, enjoying it. That was in October 2014. Um, I also got some rather negative responses from, I got a lot of hate mail actually about this because a lot of people disliked the fact that we had a female prime minister and that she had particular views, I suppose. What sort of person dedicates their time and effort into producing this sort of thing, meaning the choir piece? A taxpayer funded dropkicker who's been brainwashed by the ABC in our education system, left us with large taxpayer grants and no strings attached. By the way, the whole piece was not funded. It was paid for privately. So, <laughs> um, anyway, but that's, uh, so this is, I wanted to talk about how this piece took shape collaboratively. Um, with such a close relationship now forged, forged with the choir, I felt very at home turning up with sketches and half written ideas. The first rehearsal that you see here was just a little segment of the music where I picked out some of the catchy lines from the speech and some of the speech melodies, but not much more. So then I realized that I added, I, added a, I, I took a lot more of the speech and I said a whole lot of it, too much actually. And I got them to sing it and then realized, oh, it's just a bit too cumbersome. There's too much information. It's like, it's, it's quite a long speech. I was almost trying to do the whole speech, but it was too much. It was like constant recitative and not enough aria. So I thought I need a section where the audience can relax a bit and not have to be taking all this information and rhythm in. Um, and I'll take an ostinato of not now, not ever, and then have a more aria-like melody over the top. So that was the first rehearsal by the 26th of January, 2014, Australia Day. So that was like a month later. And then a few days later, the whole piece was ready to record and we made a recording of it.
So that's the second part of the piece. Um, now that same year, uh, a book came out edited by Margaret Barrett from our music department here at the School of Music in the University of Queensland, a book about collaboration. And the opening essay by Margaret Barrett has a very nice summary of some of the effective aspects of collaboration. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read a little bit of the book, just a sentence, where she summarizes some of the things which mark effective collaboration based on, you know, summarizing the literature by John Steiner, Keith Sawyer and others. Collaborative work is characterized by a range of elements, including time and commitment to dialogue, extended time working together, mutual trust, shared ownership, the capacity to give and receive constructive critique, and complementary rather than replication of skills and knowledge. So those aspects are interesting to look at in terms of how collaborations may be effective. And these are things that I've certainly experienced with this particular collaboration with the choir on Not Now, Not Ever. I talked to a number of the uh, singers and the conductor later on about what their experience was like in this collaborative collaboration and they really amplified some of these thoughts of those aspects of collaboration this is stradbroke island where first of all we had that time extended time working together over quite a long period by this like three years we'd done a lot of different projects together we knew each other that certainly helps here is gordon hamilton talking a little bit about his memory of that experience this was just um a few months afterwards i talked to him and said what what did you think of it What's worked really well with you, especially with, with this particular piece, is that I've, I tend to just sort of rattle off a bunch of thoughts to you that just, just sort of where we're at with it, what's working or what's not quite working. But then I, I like to just leave it to you to, to solve it or to not solve it or, you know, for you to decide, well, that's not, that's not an issue that needs solving, you're just going to perform it, you know. And, and so I don't like to, you know, beyond saying which is what I think what, uh, I, I don't want to force a composer into a particular solution um, because that's not really my role. I prefer to just talk, sort of talk about what, what I feel or what it sounds like or what the impression is from, from inside the ensemble. And, uh, and then you respond really well to that. And, you know, sometimes we get a, a sort of a radical rethink of a certain bit and other times you leave it exactly the way it is. And then I, I respect that. So that, and then that's part of that is the capacity to give and receive constructive critique, but also being able to pick and choose what that is, I think. So one thing was, um, uh, this was a response after the first rehearsal. I love the tune with the voice. I think the noise from the opposition, now say the government, is also very interesting, as is the interjection from the speaker. So that's something that I've tried, to, that I added after the first rehearsal was to there's all these interjections and I got the singers to double those as well as the main speech. That was as a result of this uh, email. Um, and I sent him the sketches and, you know, we, we had a conversation later on. What is this? Uh, two, um, a week later or something. No, look, quite a long time later. The piece is sounding great. Everyone is saying to me how much they love it. I think you're totally right. Just a bit of high soprano will be very welcome. Sometimes the rhythm on the score. So it gives me specific tips and that was very, very helpful. And I made those changes. Um, and then the other idea was then to add in that aria section that came out of conversation. Here's a, um, here's a comment from one of the choristers. The very, uh, this is about time and commitment and together. This, uh, the first rehearsal that took place at this weekend away, a re weekend retreat where we spent the whole weekend together. And that's when they first sang it. It's more, more fun anyway, when we know that Oh, sorry, it's not actually what she's talking about in this one. She's saying, this chorus is saying she likes it when there is some direction. It's not just completely open. It's more, more fun anyway when we know that, that someone's willing to tell us, you know, what they want out of us rather than sort of, here you go, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Just do whatever you want. It feels less, less like a sort of relationship. Yeah, so if it's just totally open, that can be less exciting for the choir because they... It shouldn't be too open. There should be some decision making. Um, so that's dialogue as well. I, I, I absolutely love um, working with composers in rehearsal and especially yourself, Rob, because I think you're 
very, very free to changes of the score as well. Like, um, I think you know that, you know, if you write a piece, not everything in it is going to work when it's performed. So I think that's what I really love about you actually coming to those rehearsals and making those changes. You're hearing live, um, basically, people just playing with your experiment. So um, I think it's basically the best thing that anybody could do um, to bring a piece of music to life. It'll make it much better. Um, now, this one talks about how you need someone to make a decision. So there is like, it's not just purely, it's not hierarchy free collaboration. The composer in this particular case still has the sort of, is where the buck stops. I think collaboration can be difficult at times when there are too many um, voices at one point. So if there's a few and they all have very strong opinions on what they feel like the piece should be, that can be difficult. But usually that's settled pretty quickly by, I think, you know, the, there needs to be some person in charge who has the final decision. and people can put their points forward on why they think this would work, but then in the end, ultimately, it's up to the composer to decide whether they want to do it or not. Um, this now talks a little bit about the process of this particular composition and how it unfolded. Um, well, so, I yeah. remember like the very first version, because um, we got it on Tav Camp, which was that um, over Australia Day, how Tav goes and does the um, a little two-day workshop to get everyone yes. up to speed for the year and um i remember getting it and just looking at it and going oh my god <laughs> what is this oh, really? it was it was the first of all of the um uh speech med medley stuff that we'd done and so it was completely new and like completely ridiculous and i just remember sitting in, in sectional going are we actually gonna sing this like is this actually achievable <laughs> so that's actually, it was quite nice to stretch them, but then they're open to that because we had that time, you know, just trust. You worked very closely with us on the on the whole thing, and I remember you coming to rehearsals and, um, you know, like you, you were always really interested in, in how we sounded and how it actually fit together rather than just being like, here's a finished piece, go ahead, do the thing. It was, it was never like that. We always felt that we could give you feedback, and I remember you asking for feedback as well. It was really good, but... That middle section was a really great addition in the end. I think after hearing it, she's talking about the middle section where it's the more of the, the melodic section, which is less recitative, as I say it. So again, that time and commitment to dialogue. Um, we have uh, one more idea, and that's about the timbral possibilities that come out in rehearsal. Well, um, it's, it's really really cool because we can we can go from this um, kind of um, darker. Um, chorusy sound to kind of a really um, forward, bright, kind of in, you know, in some bits angry sound to, to kind of go with the mood of the piece and um, and then at the same time, in the, you know, in the not now, not ever section, the, the contrast between the men's parts and the uh, two soprano parts and stuff where we're, we're really short and sharp in the men's parts and the, the, the girls' parts are flowing and beautiful and phrased in completely different ways. So, just that kind of stuff is, is really, really good to work on um, as opposed to kind of just getting the notes right and saying, okay, we can sing that now and moving on. Mm. That's something I like about working with this choir is you know that the notes are going to be fine, the pitches and rhythms. So we spend a lot of the time talking about expression and that's where a lot of the piece came about. Uh, Tambor, he, he was talking about articulation, the, different, the contrast between the men and the women and things like that. One of the really important aspects was Julie Gillard, this Prime Minister, has quite a strong Australian accent, a real Aussie accent. And we tried, first of all, singing along with that, echoing her, and it sounded like a parody. It just sounded ridiculous. So I thought, well, we can't do that. Maybe it should be more of a neutral sort of uh, Greek chorus, sort of standard choir sound. So we tried that. But then when it got, when Julie goes off the um, script and starts speaking off the cuff in response to the leader of the opposition, uh, looking at his watch impatiently, she gets quite angry. And then the women in the choir went along with her and sang in a quite nasal Australian accent, and it really worked as a contrast from the, the rest of it. That only would have happened 
from the rehearsal. I didn't think of that in the composition. Now, I, I realise we've run out of time, so I won't play this clip where Andrew Ford talks about that. That's a radio announcer. He's talking about this piece, and he says that that's an important aspect of it. Um, that was actually used in a feature film. It's had quite a life all around the world. Um, but I won't go into that. We've, we have run out of time, I believe, uh, so I won't talk also about a piece that I did with Graham here um, using Churchill's voice. Um, however, maybe in the discussion time we could talk a little bit about that. But thank you very much. That's where I'd like to finish uh, as we have now run out of time. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Robert, for the very insightful sharing of your composition process. I must say that uh, I'm very, very much intrigued by the way that my speeches were uh, incorporated into uh, music composition, and, and especially with the choir, voice with voice. Such a wonderful marry of the two worlds. I think it's most interesting to, to have the, uh, the subject matter, which is the speeches. They, they, were, they were recorded and unintended to be, you know, uh, made into a choral or, or any art piece, but ended up uh, becoming a work of art in such a candid and uh, 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 unpretentious kind of uh, musical setting. I think it's wonderful. It's so, so, I, I find uh, indigenous in that sense because it's taken from a speech uh, of the uh, uh, ministers, uh, prime minister who are not aware <laughs> that it will be uh, use as a uh, part of your composition. I thought that was uh, very fascinating. It's just like um, if we were to work with a, a bird song, you know, the original bird song, and the, the bird is not aware that uh, it will be captured into a music composition. So I thought that's very, very intriguing, and I'm sure all audience uh, who, who is listening in uh, will be uh, taken uh, into this ride with you. So tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, this uh, compositional journey in the future, maybe? Well, I'm, I've just finished a big uh, composition, not for choir, for piano, which is the stories of many different uh, creative people throughout it. Some of them are just, they were, they were pre-recording, like, uh, so the piano it's for a pianist who actually tells the stories but sometimes she's got the voice of the person there so that's something which is about to be premiered uh, it's finished but it hasn't gone on to public yet um and actually speaking about bird songs i've just recently uh finished a piece for two pianos with recorded bird songs and other animals the the, the recordings of animals who've actually gone extinct but we have archival recordings of them before they went extinct and so i made a piece out of that as a way to sort of memorialize these animals um no but it's something i'm very interested in taking further uh especially with choir i find it with the choir it's like i say it's sort of this greek chorus supporting this unintended melody and it can be quite emotional it's like a way of empathizing with the politician something i did do in these prime minister speeches was that i got people who had very different political persuasions and i tried to empathize with all of them not to take a particular partisan view. And it's more about storytelling. So for instance, the one we just heard where she's criticizing the leader of the opposition, that leader of the opposition then became the prime minister. Um, and I did a piece with his voice, which was highly sympathetic to him as well, <laughs> just so it wouldn't be preaching one side of things, you know. Um, so I feel like there's an empathy which can come about as a result of that uh, tapping into the speech melody. And in fact, when we did that television recording with the, the, the man, Noel Pearson, right there on stage. He was actually in tears uh, because because the emotion had been increased by the singing along with it. Yeah. So uh, wonderful to hear your uh, your process in compo composing these works. Uh, I have a question about copyright and you know more, some of this uh, sensitivity issue. Uh, with regarding uh, the use of these uh, recorded uh, speeches. Are these considered uh, public domain or do you need to seek uh, permission to use them? I always do seek permission. I uh, sometimes have to pay quite a lot of money and I sometimes is beyond the budget. So I have, there have been ones I haven't been able to use. Quite a few actually. 
But um, often people would just give permission. Like this one, Julie Gillard, I got permission from, there was actually a speech right? I had to get his permission. I had to get the office of the prime minister's permission. And then the actual recording is um, is owned by the, the population because it's public. Uh, so it is public domain, but the actual speech is not public to me so that that is, is an involved process it really is and it, and I, I this is why it's good to go for someone like churchill because that's out of copyright the one that i did with graham and i have used quite a lot. Have, yeah. sorry yeah. sorry 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 go on go on <laughs> also i've i have i've often used really old ones because they're public domain yes yeah sure. but or, or, or just recorded interviews i've just recently done quite a few where i've recorded people who i know and and um and then I've got the copyright on those, yeah. Do you have people working for you on the copyright or do you no. have to find out by I yourself? Have to, I have to do it myself and it's a, it's a laborious, it takes ages, it takes months because you have to wait. Yeah, back. And the Martin Luther King one took forever because they took so long to write back to me and then finally I got the, and you have to pay, but you know, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, that's it's one of the problems with this way of working is that aspect just is quite laborious. Yeah. Yeah, I, I cannot imagine that uh, it will be something possible for us to do in Singapore because we have red tapes, you know, for so many things in Singapore. So this kind of uh, commentary on on sensitive subjects or even opinions are frowned upon. And I think clearance will well, so we wouldn't even try so but uh, congratulations mm -hmm. for the wonderful work you have done for uh, to, to, to you know it's something like a social commentary uh, but in a, done in a very artistic way and it's human voice so it's a voice with voice such a close mm -hmm. uh, uh, knitted uh, sort of uh, orchestration and mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful to hear this from you uh, oh, you members much. of the uh, here listening in, do you have questions for Robert? I don't have a question. I know Robert's work well and he actually is in the adjoining office. But um, what I love about it all too is the, we talked about social commentary. Um, I like also that it's actually composer as historian. And um, I think in a world where it's really easy to forget because there's so much new information all the time and it's easy to forget what happened last month or last week here the arts are actually keeping present and alive and reinventing that which we need to know because it informs our present and our future oh thanks i mean i think a choir is a great site for making something special for for one thing it's people singing together being in the same rhythm the same harmony it's just it's it's a fundamental human thing you know it goes back probably to the earliest origins of humans and to take a, an important speech or just an important like setting a poem to me a choir doing that is highly profound it makes it a special it's like putting into a sacred space or it just it's it's setting apart for specialness which to me is what art is all about so i, I really love how choirs do that do we have uh, a response from uh, other members of this uh listening in Hi, um, I just have a very quick uh, question for Dr. Davidson. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your wonderful works. I was just wondering, I mean, I, I know that this topic of Sepita is about collaboration with the uh, conductor and choirs, but um, have you ever had to uh, work in such a way that uh, you, have, uh, you don't have such a high level ensemble and you have to uh, uh, collaborate only with the composer and how how would that turn up for you yeah i mean i've certainly had to do that i've had to sort of just send a score off and then leave it all to them sometimes i've loved that because i've the, the performers have really brought something that maybe i didn't expect to it i like that i do like when someone does different from my expectations because that's their creative mind coming in sometimes it's been that they really didn't understand it and they maybe sang with the wrong tone or the wrong pronunciation and and it wasn't what i will i liked so i guess it's a bit of a luck of the draw really who <laughs> who performs it if they're a performer who really gets it or not 
uh, but because I'm someone who's played in an ensemble for many years, I'm so used to just being able to have that conversation with all my, you know, with the music for that. And it's less comfortable. For me. Sometimes I really don't like hearing a performance of something that I've had nothing to do with. But then other times, like I say, it can be a very pleasant surprise if someone's really brought something new to it, which is independent of me. So a bit of both, really. <laughs> the luck of the draw. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, thank you, Robert. Uh, and uh, I, I, this is such a wonderful uh, conversation with you. I think um, it's a good reminder to my students as well as that uh, we work with our performers and uh, we are not God. So whatever we have written down uh, can be changed and mm. we, are, we should be flexible um, because um, if Beethoven did it, Mozart did it, so, so do we. Um, but I think it's a common to, nowadays that the composer has the last say somehow in, in some, in some uh, readings and in some composition uh, readings. I, I, I see that, but I think uh, we should all be more flexible with changes. There's a piece that I'm uh, working with Adele right now, the, which uh, requires the choir to sing uh, harmonics uh, towards the end. And... Um, there are some to and fro and we make some changes and I, I really like that. And I, I think it resonates really well with me with what you have said earlier. Um, mm. So I think uh, we are just about running out of time at 11 o'clock. So thank you, uh, uh, Robert, for sharing your knowledge with us.